the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you let the word of God go deep into our souls and deep into our lives. Let us grow in the grace of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Anoint us to preach, anoint us to receive, anoint us to, Lord, let it make, be part of our lives, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, I want to continue talking about our subject that we have been talking about the, not last Sunday, because I wasn't here, but the Sunday before, I'm going to start speaking a series, series of messages on the book of Acts. Now, the, the book of Acts is actually the beginning of what we call the Acts of the Apostles or the ministry of the apostles. It's kind of like it takes the story from when the Old Testament, it was the patriarchs, they called it, which was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, later uh, Moses, and then all the kings, and then all the prophets. And then the Gospels is the story of Jesus, the four Gospels, refers to the stories of Jesus. Then the book of Acts is what we call the story of the Acts of the Apostles. And the Bible starts talking about the beginning of the church and how the church was birthed and then how it started to grow and expand and become all that it is then in the first century. And then it takes you into the second century. Then you have the different epistles. Where James writes an epistle, the Lord's brother, which he was the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And then later the epistles of Paul and then the epistles of John. John writes three, John one, two and three. Then Peter writes two epistles, first Peter, second Peter. Now, Paul writes most of the New Testament or the epistles because Paul was an intellectual person. He was smart. He spoke seven languages. He was able to express himself in writing and in preaching. Now, Peter doesn't write that many because Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't that intellectual, probably never went to school, probably just started fishing when he was a young man. He wasn't, he wasn't able to express himself with the pen. And so Peter did a lot of preaching different places. The same thing with James wasn't that intellectual. John was a little bit, but what John was is he had a revelation of the Lord. And so the Lord gave him revelation, so he was able to write uh, the first John, second John, third John, those second John and third John are just simply little letters that he wrote to certain churches. But because of the prophetic nature that he possessed within him, he was able to write the book of Revelation, which talks about the end times. It's the revelation of what's going to happen once we hit a certain place or a mark in time. Because God deals everything according to his timetable. So a certain time, then all of a sudden we will find ourselves in the book of Revelation. Now John does give you a brief history by writing to seven churches. The seven churches that he's writing to, he's telling them all their good points, and then he tells them one bad thing about that church. And as you read it and study it, you come to realize that he's talking about time. He's talking about the first century when he first writes to the church in Ephesus. Then the second century, he writes to another church. And then the last century, the last century which is our century, he talks about that you have become lukewarm. And it'd be better if you were either hot or cold because then the Lord would spit you out of your mouth. So when we look at the New Testament, the New Testament starts with Matthew, but then all of a sudden you have the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the beginning. It's kind of like the history, the history of the church. Just like the first five uh, Old Testament stories, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is the beginning of creation 
and then the beginning of the patriarchs, and then it takes you into going into the promised land. Joshua is simply a book of them conquering the promised land, so it's an it's a action book, just like the book of Acts is more of an action book. And so when you look at the book of Acts, there's a couple things that we have to look at. And we mentioned them last uh, couple Sundays ago, but just to give us a little bit of history, a little go back to remind us that in the book of Acts, it really demonstrates that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one. They are one. Though they are different, they are one. The Father operated in the Old Testament with Jesus making appearances every now and then. Then the Holy Spirit would come and rest upon somebody to do something miraculous and then leave. So in the book of Acts, you see them once again, all three of them, doing their ministry. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's three, but they are one. There are three, but they're one. And now we realize in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit's ministry or the Holy Spirit's job is to make us one with the Father, one with the Son, and one with Him. In other words, that's what He's doing. He's bringing the church together so that he could make us one. So together we would be one heart, one mind, and one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we mentioned that he calls us to a formation. That the book of Acts, the Lord calls the Holy Spirit to formation. To come alongside. It's referring to the Father calling the Holy Spirit to a formation, and we are coming to a formation. We need to make the formation that the Holy Spirit is calling us to become one accord. Now, when the Holy Spirit makes a formation, remember, he comes and he comes quickly. Now, the Holy Spirit's job is now to blend together the lives of the members of the family of Christ to align our lives to the plan that the Father revealed to the Son, the Son prophesied his plan, and now it's the job of the Holy Spirit to reveal the plan of God to all of us, that his church would be built. The one prophesied would be built, that it's the Holy Spirit's ministry to make sure it happens. Jesus prophesied about it, prophesied in the Gospels that it would take place. So we need to realize, first of all, that we need to make the formation. And the last Sunday that we were together where I was here, we made that formation. We made the formation. In other words, we responded to the call of God to do what God wants us to do. We've agreed for a while back, we preached on harmony, we preached on agreement, and all of us came together in harmony, in agreement to do God's will. So now we just need to put some, put some steps or some action behind it to actually make the formation. Now, the book of Acts is known as the Acts of the Apostles, but in actuality, it is the Acts of the Holy Spirit using and moving through his chosen vessels. So the book of Acts, I'll say it again, is the acts of the Holy Spirit using and moving through his chosen vessels. That's why when you read it from Acts chapter 1 all the way to Acts chapter 8, it's a story of how God uses normal people, normal people like me and you, moves through our lives to accomplish the Father's will that Jesus prophesied. In the Old Testament, we don't really look to it as normal people. We look to it more as the heroes of faith. From Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
and so on and so forth. They're known more as heroes of faith. Ordinary men that became extraordinary when the Spirit rested upon them. And when you read the Old Testament, you look at it in a way where you say, these guys were way different than me. They, they, were, they were special people. They were patriarchs. They were heroes. They were exceptionally tall, exceptionally strong, you know, especially you know, revelation and prophetic and uh, theologians and spirit men, and that's how you look at it, and even the women that were involved in the Old Testament. But the book of Acts is ordinary people, just like me and you, that the Holy Spirit moves through their lives and moves through our lives to accomplish God's will. Ordinary people, we're not exceptional. We don't look that exceptional, right? There's none of us here that are really that exceptional, really that great, really that smart, right? Even uh, one of the scriptures that uh, Victory Outreach likes is God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound those things which are wise, wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound those things which are mighty. Ordinary people like me and you. And God chose us. Most of us didn't even grow up in church. Right? Most of us really didn't have, like, a Christian background. I had a Catholic background, which was Christian in one sense. But, you know, when you become a teenager, then you kind of stray away from it. But God uses ordinary people to accomplish an extraordinary task because then when this extraordinary task is accomplished, people have to give God the glory because they surely aren't going to give us the glory. So that's what the book of Acts is about. God using people like me and you, just normal people to do his will. Do his will. So we'll see time and time again the Holy Spirit revealing the plan that the Father gave the Son in secret. Then the Son prophesied God's plan. And once it is prophesied, the Holy Spirit takes control of it and reveals it to us and then gives us the strength, the anointing, the power to carry it out using ordinary people to do an extraordinary task. God has called Victory Outreach, San Jose Victory Outreach International, to do something that extraordinary, that is bigger than all of us, bigger than we can even imagine and he's called us to do a work for him in this century. Extraordinary people. We're all ordinary. Amen. Right? We're all, were we holy? I wasn't holy. Right? Most of us weren't holy people. Well, there was probably a few of you that were holy. But most of us were not holy people. But God wasn't looking for holy people. God was simply looking for for somebody that would make the formation and say, yes, I will do what God has called me to do. But thank the Lord that he does it with not just in our own strength, but he gives us the strength of the Holy Spirit to accomplish his will. Come on, give the Lord a hand for that. He made the formation. Acts Chapter 1, verse 23. Now, I want us to look at these verses because you're going to see some things that are going to happen through the book of Acts over and over and over again because it's referring to the story of the first century church. It's referring to the story of, of the apostles where the first seven or eight chapters is the story of the church 
the apostle James, John, Peter, all of them. And then around Acts chapter 11 really starts the, the ministry of the apostle Paul. And it takes the story of the apostle Paul because he was the one that actually created a denomination or put a denomination together that affected the whole world. So we see two parts of the book of Acts. But you'll see things happen over and over again. In Acts chapter 1, verse 23. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barabbas, also known as Justice, which is Barnabas. We'll tell about that later. And Matthias. And then they all prayed for the right man to be chosen. Oh, Lord, they said, you know every heart. Show us which one of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas. These guys are really revealing it. The traitor in this ministry. He has deserted us and gone where he belonged. They had no mercy whatsoever. Then they cast lots in the way, that, in this way, Theus was chosen, Mattias was chosen, and became an apostle with the other 11. Now you'll see some exactly four things, kind of like five things, that are going to happen throughout the book of Acts. The first thing you're going to see is the choosing of men and women for the call of God so that people would say yes to the plan of the Father. You're going to see that over and over again. The plan of God revealed to a person and given them an opportunity to say yes to the plan of God. God starts calling men and women from Acts chapter 1 all the way to Acts chapter 8 over and over and over again. The calling of God upon a man's life. That it's going to happen. The calling of God upon a woman's life. You'll see the calling of God upon a married couple's life. You'll see the calling of God upon a city where God calls a whole city, where God calls a church. You're going to see that over and over again, God placing his hand through the Holy Spirit and calling them to do his will for them. Remember, the plan or the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the plan that the Father gave Jesus in secret, then Jesus prophesied his plan. The Holy Spirit then has to take the plan, reveal it to us, and then give us the power to do the plan. It's up to us to say yes. It's up to us to say yes. Say yes to the calling of God. Yes to the plan, to the plan that God has for you as an individual and the plan that God has for us as a church, the plan that God has for us as a region, the plan that God has for us internationally, to have a victory outreach in every major city in the world. See, that's the job of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to reveal the plan to us and then say, it's up to us to say yes. And in the beginning, we say yes a little emotionally. We get excited and we say yes because we're grateful, because we realize that God delivered us or saved us. So it's easy to say yes in the beginning. But then later on throughout life and you bog down with life, different things happen to you. You maybe make mistakes. You do different things. You get kind of sidetracked. You get kind of cold. You get kind of... Uh, you know, lazy, you get kind of, you know, preoccupied, you catch a different vision, then it's easy to have back down on your yes. And it's been easy in Victory Outreach San Jose, if I must say it, I hate to say it, but I have to say it, that it's been easy for many in Victory Outreach San Jose to kind of fall by the wayside. Because for many years, we had no building. We were just traveling from here, hither and thither. We, there wasn't a lot of ministry that we could do. We didn't offer a lot of ministry to a lot of people because there wasn't really that much to do because we were just trying to survive. So it was easy for many of you that had said yes for many years, all of a sudden to lose the vision. Find yourself strayed 
or find yourself gotten cold or found yourself just nowhere. Now we're back. Not that we left, but now the Holy Spirit is with us. And once again, he's revealing his plan to you so that you could say yes. So you could say yes. And you got to forget about the past and start looking towards the future. Forget about the past. Paul said, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forget about the past. Let's move forward. Don't let the past take you back. Don't let the past keep you cold. Don't let the past keep you dry. Don't let the past keep you stale. Take off those messed up bands and let the Lord grab hold of your life again. And you're never too old to do God's will. You're never too old to do God's will. You can be 55 years old and still go start a church or take over a church. You're never too old. You're only old in your head. You're only old. That's viejo en el mente. That's it. You're only old as you feel. Because some young people, man, they sleep and sleep like if they're old. You're only as old as you claim you are. Right? You could be 75. I mean, Caleb was 80 years old. He said, give me my inheritance. Give me my mountain. He took the roughest mountain that the army there was tough. They had ironing, iron chariots. He said, that's fine. I'm really not tripping on them. What I trip on, that is if God be for me, who can be against me? You're never too old. And the Holy Spirit is constantly knocking at your door, constantly tripping your feet so that you'll fall down and look up. Constantly putting you through situations. So you have to look to the Lord and you have to say, okay, I will do your will. The Holy Spirit is going to arrest you. You could escape, but he'll arrest you over and over again. Some people run from the calling of God. Some of you have been running for many years. You run and you keep going. But let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit is not going to let you go. See, that's his ministry, to make sure that you accomplish God's will. So it's on him. He doesn't want to have to stand before the Father and the Son, and when they say, what happened to this person? He doesn't want to have to say, well, I tried. You know, I, I went out, and they kept running from me. I couldn't find them later on, you know, and they got into this. The Father and the Son ain't going to want to hear that. They're just going to say, did he do my will? And he'll have two answers, yes, or he'll say no. And if I was you, I would be somebody that says yes. It might have taken me five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but eventually I yielded to God's plan. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You're going to see this in the book of Acts over and over again. The next thing you're going to see in the book of Acts is repent. Replacement. Many will not respond to God's plan that was made available to us by accepting Jesus as our personal Savior. You cannot do God's will without serving the Lord. The second thing that you're going to see in the book of Acts, and it's a very sad thing, but is the replacement of people that did not say yes or say yes and then fell by the wayside. The replacement of an individual. Acts chapter 1 starts with it. The scripture that I read. They said, we need somebody else to be the 12th disciple. They called Judas a traitor, a deserter, and probably a bunch of other things that Dr. Luke did not want to put in the book of Acts. 
replacement. The replacing of somebody that could have made an impact in the world. The replacement of somebody had the anointing and the power, the Holy Spirit, and the right to do his will that was called by the Father to accomplish God's will, that was predestined before the beginning of time to do God's will. Because we were actually, many of us were predestined before we were even born, before our father and mother would be, even before the beginning of time. Because before God created the heavens and earth in Genesis chapter 1, he actually created everything in his, in his mind. And so then he called everybody into existence and called them into the ministry before the beginning of time. And then once he spoke it into existence, then everything starts taking its place. So many of us have been called before time, we were predestined to God's will. But what you're going to see in the book of Acts is some people having to be replaced because they didn't say yes to the will of God. They didn't say yes to the will of God. And that word replacement doesn't make a lot of, we don't like that word because of the fact that we feel that Jesus is love, merciful, and he's full of forgiveness, which he is. He's love, he's merciful, and he's full of forgiveness. But you have to remember, nothing, nothing will ever stop him from fulfilling his will. There is no love, no mercy, and no forgiveness that will stop get him to not accomplish his will. That's why Jesus, when he was here, I got to do the Father's will. I got to do the Father's will. I got to do the Father's will. So you're going to see replacement. The replacing of people that did not want to yield to God's will. Replacing. The replacement. They didn't do or fell short of doing God's will. So you're going to see them having to be replaced in the book of Acts. Over and over again. You'll see couples, married couples, being called to do God's will. One comes to mind, a couple that when everybody was selling all their goods and giving it to the apostles, and then all of a sudden they decided to get a scheme going, and they told Peter, we're going to give you so much, so he says, cool. So then later they go and sell their property, and they come back, and they say, well, we only sold it for this much because they were kept back in the other part. So Peter's there, and he says, why are you lying to the Holy Ghost? And when the man heard that, bam, he fell dead. Then all of a sudden, the wife comes. Peter says, tell me, how much did you sell your place for? Did you really sell it for this much like your husband says? Yes. Then he says, how come you lied to the Holy Spirit? And bam. Then he says, look, the feet of them that carried your husband are going to carry you out. And bam, she went down. And the whole church, fear came upon the whole church. I mean, if you're lying and dying, you're not going to lie no more. So then they had to be replaced. The replacement. Replacing, and you're going to see that in the book of Acts. The replacing of individuals. And it's not easy to replace people. It's not easy to say, well, we got to replace you. It's not easy to say, well, brother, you, you got to give up this part of the ministry. You know, it's not easy, but you're going to see it in the book of Acts over and over and over again. The replacing of individuals. You don't want to ever experience being replaced. I mean, it's not the end, but you don't want to experience it. 
believe me. You're going to see it in the book of Acts. See, the Acts is a book about the Holy Spirit moving through ordinary people. Ordinary people like me and you. Like the person sitting next to you. Look at that person next to you and say, you're ordinary. Right? Because we are ordinary. All of us are ordinary. Unless you got superhuman power. If you got superhuman power, fly around the building. But most of us are ordinary individuals. So the, in the book of Acts, you're going to see the Holy Spirit coming and calling people. And not only calling, but going after and going after and bringing you here to receive God's plan. The next thing you're going to see is the selection. Now, the selection is this. The Holy Spirit moving through man a replacement by using the power of his foreknowledge that he did not use in the first place. So then he chooses you. Let me say this again. The Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're three, but they're one. Everybody say they're three, but they're one. And when they call somebody, they don't use the power of foreknowledge. See, the power of foreknowledge is this, that when they look at you, they know if they're going to succeed or fail. They're going to know if you're going to heaven or hell. But when they call somebody, they don't use that power in order to give you an opportunity to make kind of like your own destiny. Did you catch that? They don't use the foreknowledge when they call you. If they did, then they would say, we're, oh, never mind. Because they would see things in you. But what they do is say, no, you could do it. I've called you. I love you. You could succeed. You're going to make it. You're my man. You're my woman. I have called you. I have chosen you. I have ordained you. I have anointed you. I have selected you from the foundation of the world. You are going to be my man. You're going to go to this city. You're going to build a ministry. You're going to conquer. You're going to be more than a conqueror. You are my champion. That's why they call you. They do not use their foreknowledge. See, because if they use their foreknowledge, then some of us were created to go to heaven and some of us were created to go to hell, which is predestination. And that's what some denominations believe in, that we're predestined. So they believe that you could sin and sin and sin, but at the end you're still going to be saved. You could never be erased from the Lamb books of life. But we don't believe like that. In Victor Outreach, we believe you blow it, you blow it. You're going to get your name written off, scratched out of the book of life. We believe that there is a heaven, and we believe that there is a hell for those that have made their own bed. Please answer your phone or turn it on and let them hear me preach. Destination. The destination that we will arrive at depends upon us. So God chooses then when you don't yield to it, or if you yield to it, then God's action starts, the moving of the Holy Spirit. Then there's the replacement you're going to see in the book of Acts. When you, somebody doesn't yield, then God's got to do his will, so he'll replace you. The third is the selection. The selection, the Holy Spirit uses men and women now to go out and to select individuals to replace those that did not yield to God. The first time, it's just God calling. Now God uses man, the Holy Spirit, not that he doesn't do it himself. He still does it himself. But in the book of Acts, you actually see Paul, Peter, and all these apostles actually calling men and calling women into the ministry under the unction of the Holy Ghost. So I came to San Jose because it was God's will, right? Come on, back me up now. I came to San Jose because it was God's will. But I might be a replacement. Somebody might have been called, but didn't yield, so then God called me. You know, when God spoke to me to go back to the home, because I told you I was in the home, and then I left the home. I went back into the home 
on a Thursday night. Friday, I met Sister Mincy. So the Holy Spirit spoke to me later saying, somebody to had to meet Mitzi so Mitzi could share the vision about San Jose so they could go to San Jose. Somebody had to be there to meet her. If I would not have yielded and went back to the home that night, there would be some ugly guy up here preaching. I didn't know it, but now I could say I am glad that I was not replaced. And if Mitzi would not have been there, then I would have met somebody else. An ugly girl. <laughs> but she would have been a Northenia. She would have had to share the vision. Because that's what happened. In Bible school, we started to say, hey, we need to fast and pray every once a week for a city. And I said, what city? She goes, let's pray and fast for San Jose. So back in 75, we started praying and fasting for San Jose. We had no intentions of coming or thinking it was us. It was simply the vision. So God then goes out and selects through the moving of the Holy Spirit, men and women that are under the unction of the Holy Spirit to call people into the ministry. And God gives the leader an anointing to spot certain things in certain individuals so that he could say, hey, God has called you to take a seat or God has called you to be an evangelist or God has called you to be here with us, but God has called you because that is the unction or the anointing of the Holy Spirit that God places upon a man so man can see with the eyes of the Lord, not see how man sees, but sees how God sees, it sees the heart, and then the choosing takes place. We really need to get a microphone that has no string. You guys got me here in prison. I have to stay here. You guys got me on a leash. I have to stay here. They're supposed to be fixing my microphone. They gave it to one, then they gave it to a mechanic, and I don't know why. But now I'm here with a, I feel like a kid. That You see those kids that they put leashes on them? <laughs> and they let them run around, and then every now and then, boop, the mom brings them back. I'm like on a leash. Amen. Praise God. Maybe I got to be on a leash. I don't know. The selection, the Holy Spirit moves upon man and gives man an anointing to see how God sees and then somebody is called into the ministry. I really don't know how it's happened many times, why we started working with certain individuals to send out. I, I don't know. I, Sometimes I try to think, well, what did I see so I could see again? I don't know, but all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just moves and it happens. So you'll see that through the book of Acts. The next thing you'll see is a distinction. The Holy Spirit will be showing the difference from those that are followers of Christ and those that live in the Spirit and those that live in the world and those God is with and those that God is not with. You're going to see that in the book of Acts, a distinction. God is going to start showing people, us, that he is with us. And you really start to see in the book of Acts where God is with some and God is with not with some. You see it over and over again. Just like when they were going to kill the apostle Peter and somebody else, Gamal came up and said, look, why are you even messing with these guys? If it's not God, they're going to fall apart. And then he mentions two different people. He says, but if it's God, if it's the Lord, you better stop because then you're going to start fighting against God. The Holy Spirit makes a distinction. He'll always make a distinction. 
that he is with those that he's called. A lot of people talk about Victory Outreach. A lot of people will leave Victory Outreach and talk, talk trash, junk, whatever, lies, say all kinds of stuff. Don't matter. God still makes it that he is with us. Amen. God's still with us. No matter what people say, no matter what people say about Victory Outreach or say about Pastor Ed, no matter what they say about Pastor Ed, God has made a distinction that he is with us. Right? That's it. That's it. God has made a distinction. In the book of Acts, you'll see it over and over again. People will say, oh, Victory Outreach is going to fall apart. When I leave, Victory Outreach is going to come tumbling down. Hello, we've been here for 29 years, and we are going to be here for another 29 years. The Holy Spirit will always make a distinction in those that live in the spirit and those that live in the flesh. And you see that in the book of Acts, and you even see it in the church. The Holy Spirit reveals people that live in the spirit, and then all of a sudden he reveals those that are in the flesh. All of a sudden your sins find you out. Because that's, that's the job of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to separate. That's why people will say, wow, I thought they were really spiritual. Yes, they were. Maybe, or they faked it, or they pretended, but the Holy Spirit will always pull your covers. Will always pull your covers. Because that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to bring distinction. You could, you could fake it. You could make people believe you could even sin and hide where nobody knows that nobody could see but the Holy Spirit what you do in secret will shout it from the mountaintops because the Holy Spirit will always make a distinction separate he that is real and he that is not real he that is really serving God and he that is not serving God he that is in the spirit and he that is in the flesh because that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit and you're going to see it over and over again. He even says in Exodus, I will make a clear distinction between your people and my people. This was the Lord telling Pharaoh. A distinction. Always make a distinction. The first thing that you'll see in the book of Acts is God choosing. The second thing you'll see is the replacing because those that don't yield to the calling of God. And then the third thing is selection. And the fourth thing is distinction. He'll always make a distinction between those that live in the spirit and those that live in the flesh. Now, the reason why he does those four things is because Jesus prophesied about it. Let's look at Matthew 28. You could look at the screen. We have some scriptures there. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have given complete authority in heaven on earth therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit teach these things to the disciples to obey all commands i've given you and be sure of this i am with you always even to the end of this age he makes that distinction he does all that because what he's going to do he's going to give them authority Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everywhere, to anyone. Anyone who believes is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will handle snakes with safety. And if they drink any poison, it won't hurt them. They'll be able to place their hands on the sick and heal them. That's why he does those four things, because after, this is what you receive. But you shall receive power 
Acts 1 8, when the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be a witness unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That's why those four things happen, because what happens next? In the Old Testament, the power of God, he would do something, or he would allow his power to be demonstrated. Or the Holy Spirit would rest upon somebody. It's like Samson. All of a sudden, the Spirit would get on him, and then he'd do something miraculous. But then the Spirit would leave. That's the way the Old Testament worked. It would come upon somebody and then leave. And that's what happened. Now in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is now going to come upon somebody's life and stay on somebody's life. Come on, give the Lord a hand for that. The Holy Spirit now wants to come and stay on somebody. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon somebody, something miraculous would take place, then the Spirit would leave and then later come at a different time. But now in the book of Acts, you're going to see the Holy Spirit come upon people and stay upon people. That's why when Jesus talked to them, in Luke 24, verse 49, he says this, And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. Very important that they had to stay in Jerusalem. Okay, but you can't make this mistake. Mistake that a lot of individuals make in John chapter 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. He spoke to them again and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive them, they are forgiven. You see, what Jesus did then is he gave them the Holy Spirit to accept him as their personal Savior. When you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit, and you receive the Holy Spirit by receiving Jesus as your personal Savior. How many are saved this morning? Then you receive, the Lord breathed on you, you receive Jesus through the Holy Spirit. What Jesus was talking about, for them not to leave Jerusalem, he was talking about a different kind of power. Because if he, when he breathed on them, if he was talking about a power for them then and now, then there would have been no reason to go to Jerusalem and wait. Because they would have received it already. How many have the Holy, how many have Jesus in their life? How many have the Holy Spirit in your life? Right? You receive the Lord, the Lord breathed on you. That's why when you got saved, you felt clean, you felt pure, you felt holy. And if you didn't feel it that second, as the days went by, you started feeling holy and pure. Why? Because the Holy Spirit breathed on you and took all that sin out of your life. And some of you, he had to take a deep breath. To get all your sin out of your life. Some of you, he just... Because you weren't that big of a sinner. Some of you, he had to breathe. Some of you, he had to. Oh, just hold them, ghosts. Just hold them, Holy Ghost. Ready? Hold them. And some of you just. Some of you, he's still. Some of you, he had to reload. Right? Some of you, he had to reload to get the Holy Ghost in you, to get rid of all that sin. Some of us were sinners. Oh, man, when I think of my own life, I was a sinner. I was like, 
a sin I'm glad none of you knew me. I was a sinner. A downright dirty, filthy, good for nothing, dope fiend. That's all I, I was a dope fiend. I was a heroin addict. I was a junkie. I was a tegato. You didn't want to know me because I would have stole from you. I would have burned you. I would have, if you would have gave me a ride, I would have got off your car and took your stereo and you wouldn't even know because your music would have still been playing. <laughs> then all of a sudden your music would have stopped and you would have said, what happened? And it was gone. I was bad. I was bad. You guys were bad too. Some of you were bad, right? Some of you were bad. I was bad. I was like really bad. I was like, whoa. Even when I'm thinking about it, whoa. I was bad. I was like bad. You know, I wasn't violent, but I was bad. And I don't mean bad like bad. I mean bad, but just, uh, you know, heroin was my God. Heroin was my love. Heroin was my wife. Heroin was my everything. I even have the tattoo on my fingers, DFFL, which mean, what meant this, dope forever, forever loaded. Jesus breathed on me. Thank you, Jesus. How many are glad Jesus breathed on you? How many are glad Jesus breathed on you? How many are glad Jesus breathed on you? Thank you, Jesus, that he breathed on us. So you're going to see these things happening over and over again. They're going to happen because what God wants to do in your life, he wants to give you an extraordinary power upon your life. But we'll get into that next time. Come on, everybody standing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your hands. Just thank God that he breathed on you. Come on, start thanking the Lord that he breathed on you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Somebody, some of you might be saying, yes, Pastor Ed, you really needed Jesus. But so do you. Because when Jesus looked at me, all he seen was sin. When he looks at somebody that maybe never did anything wrong, all he sees is sin. That's all he sees. He sees the depth of sin in your life, the depth, you know, how deep it is. But, you know, you could have been self-righteous and so full of yourself and so full of sin that you were just like me. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody. We were all sinners. And we're all just simply sinners saved by grace. You know, every day doesn't go by that I don't say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you. Because I was headed to hell. That's where I was going. And I was moving rapidly. I was going echala mocha to hell and taking as many people as possible with me. Everybody I met that was not a heroin addict, I turned on to heroin. I turned on a whole generation to heroin. I feel bad about it. For years, I felt bad. For years I felt bad because I, I turned on all these guys that were a couple years younger than me, turned them on to heroin. And I slowly but surely started seeing their lives 
make it worse than mine. But you know, as I got saved, I started praying. Many of them gave their life to Jesus. Because once I got saved and got turned on to Jesus, then I wanted to turn on everybody that I met. Because now I'm on my way to heaven. And I want to take a whole lot of people with me. Amen. A whole lot of people. Glory to God. Huh? Praise the Lord. Let's sing this song, Come Holy Spirit. Come.